glad to have you along with us for this latest edition of our Hear Me, See Me podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Bruner. Hear Me, See Me is a mental health awareness initiative of WIBW TV. You can see it here online. We have episodes on air and you also can find resources at WIBW.com slash Hear Me, See Me. Our guest today is a musician. He is also a pastor. He works with young people. Braille Watson is his name and he has quite a journey through mental health and that in fact is your latest project continually focusing on it yeah so what I like I, I don't know you well Brill, but I've mm -hmm. known of you for many many years mm -hmm. and you are a rapper you are mm -hmm. also classically trained you play the cello you have a master's degree yeah. in music and it's it, it is it lends itself well to a mental health discussion because it's about layers and yeah. about what you mm -hmm. maybe see in one respect but there are these other things that are happening right, over here. Right. So what inspired the project that you have? It's called Work in Process. Well, Work in Process is, most people may not realize, but often when an artist is putting out an album, they're like, oh, wow, this must be where they're at right now. And it, it, it wasn't. There was a series of different songs that came from different periods, different things that had happened. Um, but actually, I was in a session with my therapist ironically, and he was telling me about how it seems like the time that I spend in music is a time when God speaks to me and I'm able to process. And I was like, yeah, it really is. And he was like, you need to dedicate more time to that. And so I said, okay. And as I did that, um, I had been pulling together this series of songs where I've been processing different things. And I already had the idea, work and process, it's kind of what I want to do. Um, but as I was sitting there, I was like, I. I want to do more with this project. And so that inspired me to then reach out to a team of therapists and go, hey, how do I make this not just cathartic for me, but a mental health resource for my whole community so that people can see someone be vulnerable in process, but also learn how to process themselves. And well, that's what led to that. And I don't think you need to be a musician to agree that music makes us feel. Right. No, no, it does. <laughs> How much has music helped you in your life, whether it be listening to music and helping you work through emotions in one way, but then also creating music yourself and using that outlet for your emotions? Yeah, it is. It's where I process. I tell a lot of people I sit down at the piano and a lot of times I get I talk about this on the album. Sometimes I get like emotionally constipated. Like I can't <laughs> I feel things and I have a hard time expressing everything that I'm feeling mm -hmm. and when I sit down at the piano or with my cello those feelings come out of sounds and what I couldn't articulate is now something that's in the air that I can hear that I can manipulate that I can use that I can observe and I feel like those are the moments when I can process those are the moments when God speaks to me and then I often write and so it it is how I process when I was young uh, I was a part, I got signed to an independent label here in Topeka when I was 14 years old. And we would go do these shows at like clubs and bars and things. And my and mom. You're 14. Yeah, I'm 14. <laughs> I was at the booby trap at 14. And my mom was like, hated it. Um, but whenever I get in trouble, she's like, the one thing I won't take from you is your time in music because I, I know that's an outlet for you. And I know that helps you. And I've, I've been in therapy since I was probably six, seven years old. And so, or that's when I first started getting therapy and getting, getting mental health help. And so it's always been something that has been on my mom's mind and on my mind and music has always been the main way that I've processed. So before we move forward, talking more about the new project, let's step back to mm -hmm. what you just mentioned. What was growing up like for Braille Watson in Topeka, Kansas? Um, <laughs> that's a loaded question. Uh, growing up was interesting. So. My, my father lived in a house until I was six. My father was, uh, to just say it plain, he was mentally and physically abusive to my mother. And so he had some different struggles. And so I, I witnessed a lot of that. He was kind of in and out of the house. And so that drove a lot of my development as a kid. When I was six years old, there was kind of a heavy situation that happened where he left. I talk about it on the album, on the song Deja Vu. But after that, um, I really struggled a lot in my mental health. And my mom got me therapy, so I had therapy. I was, uh, other than that, I was a normal, normal kid, um, just playing and having fun. And um, we went to church every, every week, and my mom sang in the choir, so I was always at choir rehearsal and at church and listening to the music and um, things like that. And 
loved video games, loved cartoons, um, and loved music. And loved music. And as I got older, um, having those tools, especially from going to therapy and things like that, helped me, and part of my personality, helped me to be able to process some of the things that were happening around me and made me want to be able to give commentary on it. And that's what led me to start writing. What was happening around you? Mm. So I talk about this on, on one of my songs. Uh, I remember down the street from me, I had a friend who lived in a house that had no door, no front door. Mother was addicted to, to drugs. Um, he lived next door to my church, a few houses down from my church. And I remember seeing the difference between my house and his house and going like, what's, what's going on here? I remember going to uh, Scott, it's a dual language school now, but it used to be a computer technology mm -hmm. magnet school. Back when computers were a rare thing and that yeah, was like a right, super right. cool it thing to have It was special to have right? computers <laughs> at your school, right? And so I, I remember going to Scott and being with my friends and, and just seeing the differences. I remember, uh, man, I remember getting called a tar baby for being too dark, hmm. for my skin being too dark. Uh, I remember seeing different things happening in my family as far as run-ins with the law. I remember police coming and looking for my father and treating us really bad in my community. I, it was just a lot, a lot of different things that were going on. And then in my family struggles from, or like my mother did, like bipolar, um, bipolar depression. And so I, I had clinical manic depression. And so I would, my mood would shift and swing, um, irregardless of what was happening in my life. And then these other things would compound on top of that. And so trying to understand what's going on, how am I, how am I feeling? How should I feel? Um, I remember getting to, what else was I? Probably 15. Um, listening to rap music, which my mom did not want me to listen to, but it, it got in there. And then I was like, the people in this song say that they're poor. Their life sounds like my life. Mom, are we poor? <laughs> she just laughs like, yes, baby, we're poor. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I, I had no idea. But just understanding my reality. And then I went to school on the west side of town. I went from the east side of town. I was in the gifted program. So I go to French middle school and Man, that was a, I don't want to talk bad about the school, but it was a really segregated place. Not not by the administration, but the blacks hung out with the blacks, the whites hung out with the whites, the Hispanics hung out with the Hispanics. And I was there in the middle, Mr. I love everybody, I want to hug everybody, everybody should get along, um, trying to navigate that space. And then I went to high school and it was more of the same, but more extreme. And, trying to navigate that space. So like racial tension and not having any sort of framework to understand what I'm experiencing, um, but trying to make sense of it. So. Your mom, it sounds like was a good role model for you, mm -hmm. even as you watched her struggle. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like there was that sense in herself that she knew what her struggles were and therefore she was doing whatever she could in her power to make sure that those struggles didn't compound in you, the next generation, because she was able, she, she accepted putting you into therapy when you were six years old. Oh yeah, man, I, man, I, I look back and I was so blessed to have my mother, like she struggled with her mental health and still does, but um, be, when I see people that are unwilling to get help or are affected by the stigma around mental health help, I'm like, wow, I, I never had that from as early as my mom could she put me into therapy she was in therapy so I got to see her I got to see her process and that was my that's my hero that's my hero and when my dad left I became what I felt like was the spiritual leader in my household and so I'd pray for my mom and sit with my mom and my mom I'd help my mom process and we were like best friends and when my mom was struggling with suicidal ideation she'd come home and tell me and we would talk about man I thought about driving off a bridge today I thought about this and that and the third and that was that helped me to go I never want to commit suicide because I remember how it made me feel to even hear my mom speak about that and she said I'll, I'll never do it though because I, I don't want to leave you alone and it no matter how bad things got I could always remember my mom saying like I'd never do that to you and so I'm like well, I can't do that to her 
That's kind of heavy for a kid, though, to hear that <laughs> from their mom. Yeah. I mean, on, on the yeah. one hand, that openness is is refreshing, and it makes mm. you feel comfortable in being able to, you know, we say hear me, see me. It makes you comfortable in speaking up so that right. people can hear you and see right. you. But on the other hand, as a kid, was there pressure? Did oh. you, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, I don't think she intentionally put that pressure on me. But I think when you, my personal philosophy is when you live around dangers for your children, I would rather prepare them for those dangers than to hope they never experience them. You know what I'm saying? I do. Like, I, I'd, I'd rather you know what's out there and what's coming so that you're prepared to be able to defend against it or navigate through it than for you to just be hit by things. I Growing up, I got exposed to pornography early in my, like nine, 10 years old by other kids in my community. Um, that caused a struggle for me that I had to work through that I was an adult before I was able to get help for. Um, my kids, I talked to them about pornography as early as I could because I knew that it was out there. Um, and sure enough, they ended up having a struggle at their school where kids where other kids were exposing kids to pornography. But I had already talked to my kids about, here's what this is. Here's what you need to avoid. Here's what it does to your brain. Here's where you're at. And to me, I, I think it's important to expose kids to things that are appropriate for their age. And sometimes life doesn't give you that luxury. Sometimes, hey, you gotta, you gotta know what it looks like when drug deals are going down because they're happening around you. You need to know what it looks like when someone's trying to expose you to something that's gonna harm you. Cause I don't want you to get addicted to something and then have to learn what it right. is and how bad it is. And so, yeah, it was, it was heavy. Um, it was the cards that I was dealt. And I feel like my mother did the best she could to prepare me um, to handle strengthening my faith, strengthening my support system by giving me uh, resources around me to help. All of those things helped me to navigate. And if you talk to most of my teachers and the people around me, I was an exceptional student and I was great and I was this and that and the third. But those were the tools that those were the tools that my mom gave me. Um, even code switching. I don't do you know what code switching is. I'm not sure. Oh, we're about to have a fun conversation. <laughs> uh, so code switching is the phenomenon. Uh, it's usually talked about with African-Americans where they'll speak with a more widely accepted vernacular, kind of their white voice in order to be seen as more intellectual or to be accepted because people may look down on you otherwise. Uh, and so when I was young, I remember sitting at a table and my mom, my mom, I was at, a, I was at, a, I was at a table at my aunt's house and my mom was like, count to 10. I'd be like, one, two, three, four, four, start over. One, two, three, four, four, start. And I, I had to, I had to be able to say things correctly. My mom was very serious about the way that I spoke, um, and about me being polite. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Um, and because of that preparation, I got a lot of, it's going to sound like privilege, but I got a lot of special treatment at school. And when I had needs, because I struggled with anger, I struggled with depression, and I'd have outbursts at school, but because I was so polite and well-spoken, I got a lot of resources that other kids didn't. They got put in remedial classes, and they got kicked out of school, and I got help. And so that privilege it shouldn't have been that way, but it was that privilege really helped to move me through my school years, even though I was dealing with a lot of struggles and it helped me to excel in the areas that I excelled and to get help in the areas where I needed help. What um, it's the layer thing again, right? On the outside, people see this young man who is a gifted musician. He's uh, did you do well academically? No. I started <laughs> but out doing well. You were polite, and so yeah. the teacher I started said, out nice doing well. Man. By middle school, I, by, I was I was supposed to go to Duke. I had a full ride. There was like some program. There was like a full ride scholarship. As long as I kept my grades up, 
like from elementary school where I would get to go to Duke. I was on like a fast track to Duke mm -hmm. University. Um, I messed that up in middle school. So I, I did okay, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. So, so, no, but, but that means something was happening there. It's oh, this, yeah. this, this layer. Something's mm -hmm. going on beneath the surface, surface, even though you had all these tools, even though you had the support mm -hmm. of your mom. Um, what was a low point for you and how did you get out of that? Or is, is it still just this series of highs and lows? I, middle high school was, was a low point for me. Um, middle high school, middle and high school, uh, that's when I started receiving medication for anxiety and depression. Um, eventually by high school medication for ADHD because I also was diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, and yeah, my, those kind of heading into, I think my first couple years of college, I was really depressed a lot and I, I didn't know how to process it. I was just kind of fumbling through life and I had a lot of standout moments, a lot of awards. I got to be on TV and did things, but I was kind of fumbling through through life, trying to process things around race, trying to process my own mental health, trying to process fatherlessness, trying to process all of these things. And college was a turning point for me. Number one, um, I always say I became a racist in college. The experiences that I had, I mean, had a, had a friend in middle school, I had a friend throw me in a trash can because he said, that's where the Negroes belong. Throw me some change, tell me to cut his grass. High school, I experienced a lot of overt and hidden racism. And by the time I graduated high school, I was like, I can't stand white people. Like, I can't stand them. They think they run the world. I hate white people. And I, I man, I went in with a really vindictive attitude, which was wild. Layers, right? I was positive I was I was a spiritual leader I was leading the choir and doing all those things and I was struggling with this anger and resentment and hatred in my heart and I, I had a friend in college who had been all over the place and he uh, was in a military family he was like I don't understand this racism and I I took some time to explain it to him and he's like I don't understand what you're talking about racism white friend and we talked through it in our conversations like his complete he really was just he's like I don't get it. I don't have no problem with you. I don't get it. Talking through things with him helped me process. Learning things in a world history class where I learned more about history and learning the context. And then someone just pointing out that like your perspective does not align with your faith. How can you believe what you believe about Jesus and how Jesus feels about all people and feel this way about certain groups of people? And it made me realize that my pain was driving me, not the truth. And it helped me to put things into perspective where I started to see, man, racism is a sickness and I need to help people with this. And, and those things as well as, all right, I'm still in therapy at this point, right? And uh, processing things, I had a, man, huge milestone in my mental health journey. Um, I think a lot of people don't talk about this enough. So like, uh, I had I worked for Vector Marketing and I was on track to become like a manager here in Topeka to manage my own branch. And I was like, hey, I got to get out of this program because I had, I had some physical issues that had happened, some health issues that had happened. And I was like, I need to catch up. Um, I wasn't able to play my cello for like half a year. There was like a whole thing that happened with my body. And I was like, hey, I need to catch up. I'm practicing five hours a day. I can't be in this management program. And I'm really, really depressed. And never forget it. His name is Justin Donald, my regional manager. It was like, hey, if you want to get out of the program, I respect that. But have you tried drinking more water? I was like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Uh, no, sir, I have not tried drinking more water. He's like, you should drink more water and make sure that you're, how much rest do you get at night? I'm like, what does that matter? He's like, drink more water, get more rest. If you want to quit the program, you can quit the program. Good luck with school. Just drink more water, get more rest. Studies show that it's been tied to better mental health. I was like, Okay, so but I but I listened and I paid attention. So I started noticing whenever I had my fits of extreme depression because it would come out of nowhere. It had nothing to do with circumstances, just sad and depressed and despondent. I would be really thirsty. I was like, no. So I started drinking more water, got a big cup, started drinking more water, started watching how much I slept. Man, I don't sleep a lot. My sleep schedules are really jacked up. Started becoming more disciplined with those. And I started being able to manage the highs and lows, the dynamics of my emotions a lot more. Didn't stop me from experiencing them, but I started being able to manage them. And that's when I realized, oh, your physical health impacts your mental health. 
they are connected. Oh, and as my mental health started to improve, my spiritual health started to improve. I'm like, oh, all of these things are are connected. And that was a huge moment for me. And I, I felt like when I turned 23, I had a conversation with someone, one of my teachers, one of my instructors. He was giving me a ride home from Washburn. Because I used to walk home from Washburn all the time. He was giving me a ride home from Washburn. And uh, we sat in a car and he was asking me some questions. I started talking about depression. And I was like, I haven't been depressed in over a year. I feel like God has delivered me from my depression. And it was this great moment where it's like, well, I have been consistent in my emotional stability for over a year. That has never happened in one time in my life. And it was just this amazing moment. But realizing all of these things that compounded together to cause me to be healthy, Mm -hmm. to cause me to be able to be healthy. Um, And yeah. Yeah. Well, you're a few years removed from that now, and, and that's mm-hmm. not to say it's been completely smooth sailing. You continue to, right. to experience the ups and downs and things. And some of the item, things that you said there lead into the project and some of the mm-hmm. lyrics that you sent me because you start to question, is this okay? Is it okay that you need medication? Is it okay that sometimes you have the ups and downs? And in the, in the lyrics, in my jeans, it's true religion, but truth ain't fitting with my feelings. Pockets feeling the prescriptions, need a change to pay attention. Can these changes maim the image, insecure and fearing? If God don't make mistakes, then why do I feel like I can't think lest I rely on pills? Yeah. Feeling like because you had these feelings, because what some may say is a flaw, but it's not a flaw, it's just you. It's me. This is what God intended for you, mm-hmm. that for some people, they need help. Yeah. yeah. And what's the name of that song? It's called NAMI. <laughs> and I asked you, does that refer to the organization, the National Alliance for Mental Illness? And you said no. No, yes and no. So it's a triple entendre. NAMI, it, it, is, it is in reference to the organization. But the reason I named the song NAMI is because the chorus of the song is everybody needs some help, but not me, not me. Mm-hmm. So it references not me. And then there is a character on the on the cover of the album. There's an anime character. Her name is NAMI. And NAMI has a point in the story. NAMI is a really independent woman and she's a thief. And it gets to this point where she's connected to the main protagonist of the story and she has been being extorted by some pirate group and she's sitting on the floor and it turns out all of her thievery and all of this stuff has been to get out of the situation that no one even knew she was in because she was trying to protect some other people. She breaks down and she's crying and she finally says, help me. She finally gets to this point where she goes, I've been carrying this all since I was a child. I need help. And when I wrote that song, that's the, that's the place I was in. I had a, uh, I started having panic attacks at work. In my job, I do a lot of administrative work. More of that than music, actually. But I do a <laughs> lot of administrative work. And I was in a, a staff meeting, and my, my boss is a former chemical engineer. And so I work at a church, but we, we are high functioning. That's why we're able to do a lot of the community development work we do. So we plan things out at least a year in advance. So he's like, hey, I need you to put all these dates on the calendar for when you're going to do these and da 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 And what would happen is my mind would spin and I would get so overwhelmed with the options that I would have panic attacks. And I had this huge panic attack in the office and had to ask if I could just not do this right now, if I could do it later. Um, And that's when I realized I haven't been medicating for my ADHD in probably maybe eight or nine years um, because I couldn't afford the medication. And I was at a different place at this point in my life. I could afford the medication and I had helped every other member of my family at that time get on medication for mental health. And I realized I needed to be on medication. And I've always been an advocate for mental health. And a week would go by, I never made a call. Two weeks would go by, a month goes by, and I'm like, what am I afraid of? Why am I not, why am I not getting the medication? Why am I not getting the help that I need? And I had to kind of wrestle with these thoughts and my own pride of like, well, if God made me perfect, if God made me the way I'm supposed to be, then why do I need this? Why will I need this all of my life? And wrestling with that and the hypocrisy of telling my wife, it's okay that you need medication. It's okay that you need these things. And then on the other side, refusing to get help myself um, and having to, to fight with that 
what you know versus what you know. Mm -hmm. What you know versus what you know. So you spread the message to your own family. You, you mentioned deja vu refers to some of the things you went through in childhood, another, another mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. Crown is another, mm -hmm. reflections. You debuted this, essentially, um, at a youth party. Yeah. Why was that important to you? I work with the youth and I know where they're at. Um, I know the stats. I've shared the stats a, a million times. But um, I was sitting with one of our youth and I let him hear the song. So I was like, I want to hear how this connects with you. And at the end of our conversation, that youth went out and got therapy. I felt it's really important, especially for our youth, because of how vulnerable they are, to see and to hear that someone that they look up to needs help and will get help. I don't want them to be 34, having anxiety attacks and wrestling with pride because they can't admit that they need help. And uh, because I work with that population, I thought it was really important that I share that message with them. And so as I spoke with the different therapists and things, I was like, I want to do this and I want to do a concert. I lead this group of youth. I want to do something for them. I want to share this with them. Um, and so, yeah, that's plus the fact that it wasn't just a concert. It was a mental health resource fair. So we had 13 different vendors that were there to help um, people get connected to mental health resources from therapists doing ecotherapy and containment exercises and suicide prevention and um, Shawnee County Health Department was there. I thought it was super important that they had those resources. And uh, honestly, I feel like when, when your kids get help, you the parents will also get help. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had how many people there and then anecdotally the impact that that had? How many? Just short of 200 people and 54% of those who attended either received resources that day or pursued, um, like, like actively pursued resources coming away from that night. That's the power of being open and that's the power of mm -hmm. giving a safe space and an invitation to talk about things. Yeah. What do you want people to take away from work in process? I want people to start processing. Uh, mental health has become an epidemic since the pandemic. And if you go back and look at the research, it was, it was a problem before that. People were struggling with their mental health before that. Um, and a lot of us just aren't processing things. We don't have anyone to talk to to get help. Um, we're trying to medicate with other things. I want people to know that it's okay to get help. It's okay to get professional help. It's okay to get medication. Um, and I want people to start that process of getting better. You also just realized what? we have matching bands. Oh, we do. You met the Queen Plays. It's okay to not be okay. That's they what... were at the, mm -hmm. they were at the, they were one of the vendors. Yes, yeah. I met Brenda and Brenda was on the podcast here oh, a few so weeks cool. ago, a few weeks ago, because so cool. I mean, it's, it's, we're a community. Yeah. And, and I love that about your story, the, the learning of the community, the lessons to realize that all of us are communities because mm -hmm. we all can learn from each other and we all mm -hmm. have to accept each other as human beings and people and yeah. not judge this group, this group, or this group. Yeah. It's, it's a lesson for all of us to have conversations and just talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, the other message I think that you share as well is that it's not just this magic button. It, it is a lifelong journey and it's yes. something that it's not going to be snap your fingers and no. if I just do this, it's gonna be okay the next day. Yeah, it doesn't work that way you come back to it. Yeah. yeah. How much work do we have to put in? How much work do you have to put in on your physical health? Mm -hmm. I think some of us are born, it, it makes perfect sense to us when it comes to our physical bodies, right? Some of us are born with more athleticism than others. Some of us have to work a lot harder to stay fit than others. Some of us have, are born with asthma, like me. And so if we wanna play sports, then you're gonna need some inhalers and some other things like that. Some of us, some of us, our bodies can take a lot more abuse. And it's the same with our mental health. Some of us are born maybe a little more stable. We can take a little more hardship, a little more abuse, a little more staying up late at night. But some of us, or some of us need to get that eight hours of sleep. Some of us need to stay hydrated in order to mentally be sane. Some of us need additional help and resources. 
And you never stop managing your physical health. You're always trying to take care of your body or you're not. And you're feeling the impact of that. And it's the same with our mental health. If we're not managing what we put into our minds, the perspective that we have on things, um, managing our physical health in order to see how it impacts our, our mental health, then our mental health is going to deteriorate, especially in the world that we live in and in an election season. So <laughs> it's like, man, it's a lifelong journey for all of us, whether you feel like you struggle with your mental health or not. It is a lifelong journey for all of us. And I want people to embrace all the tools that are available to them. Well, I can't wait to hear your next chapter. I love seeing you in the classical setting. I love hearing you rap. I like the tracks on work in process. So can't wait for part two. Thank you. There is a track already called part two. So maybe it's part three, part four, part five. Yeah, it better be part two, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear all the facets. We'll keep real. it moving, yeah. Thank you so much. You can find For Work sure. in Process on all of the major streaming sites. Also, remember, if you have heard anything here that makes you feel you're in crisis, if you're concerned for yourself or a loved one, that 988 Lifeline is there 24-7. And we have a lot of resources as well on WIBW.com slash Hear Me, See Me. We appreciate Braille being so open with his story. And always remember, we hear you. We see you.